up. So this is another video series I've been thinking about putting up, um, obviously on stress management of all things, which I understand can be kind of random. Like why am I even putting this up? And really, really it's for practice. <laughs> okay. So like the, the other two trainings I put up, you know, I never really, you know, I've given them, well, given in public a few times, you know, really the hypnagogic meditation one I, I did once and was not at all happy with it. Um, so th those are good practice and, you know, getting some reps and trying to YouTube this shit and put it up. And this one is actually one that I've done for work several times. So hopefully she'll come off a little bit more smoothly, but I figure if nothing else, it's kind of good practice at getting used to, to delivering this kind of information in, in a different format than I'm used to. So uh, with that said, this one's going to be on stress management. Um, and this is another funny part. Normally I'm used to presenting this stuff to a live audience, trying to do it to myself in a camera. Like I said, if you see my other videos, feels very, very damn weird, but, um, nonetheless, so kind of here, I'd be kind of rolling out where, you know, it's stress a regular part of all of our lives, right? Where sometimes people try to say no, when I think really obviously stress is a big part of all of our lives, especially now in this whole coronavirus uh, situation we're currently in. Anyway, so I'll throw up this picture, be like, who's felt about this amount of stress in the last week? And, you know, pretty much everybody's going to raise their hand, right? Um, then we got this next one, things getting a little bit worse. And eventually, we get to this picture where, okay, hopefully nobody's felt this stressed in the past week. But then again, it's safe to say that we've all felt that stressed at some point in our lives. For sure, like, I mean, without a doubt. And the thing I like to point out here is, you know, even if you're, oh, you can't go back. Shit, see, that's another learning curve I got to figure out with this. So even if you're walking around, say, at that first level of stress where that lady was at work and had all those books and papers stacked up on the sides of her. So if that's your regular level of stress, right, then say the next one where the guy's pulling out his hair where... Maybe this coronavirus shit's going around. Maybe traffic's really bad, but something else kind of elevates you up. Then to make you flip out this crazy with this dude popping his and <laughs> blowing his wig off or whatever. Um, you know, it could be something small like somebody cutting you off in traffic, McDonald's messing up your order or something, something minor that shouldn't make you go that crazy. If you've already been stressed out in the previous times can really set you off. Right. So this is just a kind of nice way to illustrate how stress is a regular part of our lives etc etc right so um getting on the agenda i'm definitely not gonna blow through all this right now it's probably just doing like the first kind of chunk segment of it then i'll break out the other ones afterwards and really honestly after looking at what's on this agenda i'll probably i might break out something totally different but either way so first of all we'll define stress and that's what i plan on doing right now we'll talk a bit about the brain yeah i'll probably do that as well because I, I think that part covers some things pretty good and then We'll move on to some techniques and methods for dealing with stress. All right, so first up, let's define stress. And again, this is kind of funny. This is what normally I would ask the audience for somebody to define stress. Um, we got two different types, physical and mental. Now, obviously, we're not we're not talking about physical stress, but you know, I'll define it here really quick anyway. So, pressure or tension exerted on an object. Right. Then we have mental stress, which is basically what we're obviously getting at. So that's emotional strain or tension from adverse circumstances. And while there's obviously a ton of difference between these two uh, types of stress, the main one I like to point out here is that mental stress is subjective, right? So you actually, you can't even tell how much stress somebody is under, really. You know, maybe they hide it well, maybe you can't read it well, whatever, but but it's hard to tell, right? Because it's, it's, you know, it's subjective and then do they even display it, you know, completely on top of that. So that's a good little point. Then we have the stress hormone, which is cortisol. Um, then we like to ask, like, you know, so what does cortisol do? Basically, it tells your central nervous system to go into fight, flight, or maybe even freeze mode. I hear people say sometimes when we giving this training at work and stuff. So, um, you know, this is something that we've evolved, um, we've evolved with over the years. We share with other mammals and all of that. Basically, the example I like to give here is say it's like back in the day, long time ago. So we're on like we're on like cherry picking duty or something for our tribe right we're out there trying to gather berries for everybody back at the back at camp or something so you're over there you're picking all your berries and all of a sudden a lion jumps out and attacks everybody right so you get this big cortisol dump heart rate increase breathing increase adrenals and livers get activated they release glucose for quick energy use we just like running for your life 
right? At the same time as more cortisol enters your system, it starts to suppress things that aren't immediately important. So stuff like your immune, digestive, reproductive systems, all of that kind of stuff starts to be suppressed as more cortisol enters the system, right? And, you know, one of the good or bad things about being human, you know, is that we're so smart, right? That if, you know, once something like this happens, well, we're going to be stressing about it. You know, what's going to happen next time we're out there picking picking cherries for our crew, right? So um, compare that to like some pack animal, right? If they're over there eating their grass, lion attacks them. As soon as that lion's full and whatever out of the picture, they're back in the moment enjoying their grass, right? So what's the real takeaway with this? The takeaway is this whole system is good in the short term, but bad in the long term, right? So what's so bad about it? Well, Prolonged stress in the body can do a whole bunch of bad shit, <laughs> obviously. I think we mostly know this, but um, musculoskeletal-wise can lead to tension headaches, pinched nerves, numbness or tingling in your extremities. Sciatica can even uh, contribute to that. Uh, cardiovascular rise because you remain on alert can lead to hypertension, liver disease, heart attack, stroke, all this other bad stuff. Um, generalized symptoms, anxiety, fatigue, insomnia, ulcers. Terrible, terrible stuff, right? But really, don't stress about it too much because your brain actually has you covered. There's a bunch of feel-good chemicals up there in the brain, too. It's not all bad news. So um, I think this is probably the last part we'll do before we um, close up this first video. But now we'll talk about your brain and some of the other happy chemicals in your brain. And there's really four of them. Um, it's serotonin, oxytocin, dopamine, and endorphins. So we'll kind of go into each of those and talk about how you naturally produce those and so forth. So first up, we got the motivation molecule, which is dopamine, which helps to boost drive, focus, and determination. A natural way your body releases these is with physical activity. Now, it doesn't have to be like, you know, CrossFit action or running marathons, although people obviously run marathons and do this distance running because they're kind of addicted to it. And I mean, I say that as somebody who was in that camp until I busted my knees and my back up too much to where I could still do it, but it would take a lot of effort for me to do it anyway. Um, you know, but they're addicted to running, right? You're addicted to getting out there and putting in this work. If you have any friends who are, you know, gym rats or anything like that, it, it once you kind of get stuck on it, it's almost, it's more than easy. It's like, it's like you're addicted to it. So you get driven to it. Anyway, you get driven to it because it tends to feel pretty good. So physical activity can release dopamine, um, but also not gym, you know, playing a sport, playing with your kids, your grandchildren, Going for walks, swimming, hiking, surfing, all that stuff kind of checks that box. Uh, utilizing creativity, if you're lucky enough to find a creative outlet in your life, good for you, <laughs> first of all. Um, but it always feels kind of good to create. And even if it's not, you know, creatively doing something artistic or something like that, creatively problem solving something at work feels pretty good most of the time, right? Again, you're releasing some levels of dopamine, Sudoku puzzles even, stuff like that, crossword puzzles. You know, kind of all kind of can get you to this um, level of of um, accomplishment or release, releasing these um, dopamine, release, uh, re, uh, dopamine in your brain. Also, discovery or learning something new. Now, obviously not across the board, right? I think back to me in like high school, sitting in history class thinking, God, I never knew this information, but this shit sucks. <laughs> get me out of here. But uh, once you find something that you actually are intrigued by or want to know or learn about all of a sudden falling down rabbit holes on the internet doing this and that can be maybe you wouldn't call it fun but it's definitely it, it, it's pleasant to to, to, um, to some sort right so part of that reason is you're listening dopamine um focusing of the mind so being in the zone being in these flow states all that always feels pretty good right part of that reason is dopamine release then you have achievements big or small now of course you know, big achievements release more dopamine than small achievements, but still yet any type of achievement tends to release some level of reward. This is actually kind of um, funny here, but if, you know, if none of you, have, none of you have ever tried like making a to-do list or a checklist of some sort, that's kind of why this stuff works. Now, I'm not going to say it works for everybody, but it can be pretty interesting if you, especially if you've never tried it, try making a to-do list, going down that sucker and checking those boxes off. It does seem to give you a little bit more you know, dopamine release in the head and say, hey, good job. You know, so it, it, it can be um, it can be rewarding. It can be worthwhile. Then we have the runner's high, which is endorphin, which reduces pain and perceived stress. Uh, Painkiller drugs, a lot of the common ones act on these similar pathways and all of that. 
Natural race released this. Um, so you'll see some reoccurring themes here, right? Physical activity, utilizing uh, creativity, uh, deeper modalities of massage. You now, um, I am an LMT, and, you know, if you're like me and, you know, LMT aside, who cares about that? But if you're somebody who likes to get a lot of this really um, deep, painful type massage work done where it hurts, but for some reason feels really good, which oddly enough seems to be most people, at least that I've ever run into in my practice. But um reason why that feels good is you're really seeing um, endorphins for that. Also, um laughter, you got funny people around you, man. Keep them around you, they're good for you. Moderate alcohol consumption, I'm sorry to say moderate. Wouldn't it be awesome if you could just drink a couple of bottles of wine and just like be full of endorphins and not be hungover? Wouldn't that be amazing? Wish that was the case. But anyway, it's not. So moderate alcohol, um, alcohol consumption. So, you know, whatever, a glass or two of wine or something like that. And also moderate dark chocolate consumption. This does not mean buy a tub of dark chocolate and crack that bugger thinking endorphins, endorphins, endorphins. Right. So again, in moderation, but dark chocolate for some reason has like a ton of has a ton of studies done on it it's my least favorite kind of chocolate my wife loves it but um anyway so dark chocolate's also known to release endorphins as well then we have the mood balancer which is serotonin which helps to regulate appetite body temperature pain perceptions it's a sleep aid so serotonin converts to melatonin as it's getting dark and later in the day and you're getting ready for bed um natural ways to release this so again Physical activity, uh, massage and body work. So this is the neurotransmitter most closely related to having a good massage and, and body work done. So is um, serotonin release. But a lot of this stuff is actually made in your gut, apparently. So you want to give yourself the good, uh, the building blocks to make this stuff, right? So getting all your B vitamins, good carbs, good vegetables, fermented food, so stuff like kimchi. Um, and then proteins high in tryptophan. So tryptophan is that sleepy stuff in Turkey that people say, you know, give give Turkey a bad rap. But I think that's really, I mean, at least for the whole Turkey thing goes, is because, you know, during um during Thanksgiving, right? What are you doing? You're eating a bunch of carbs and you're drinking a bunch of alcohol stuck with your family, <laughs> right? So um, I don't really think it's Turkey that's making you sleepy. I think it's the fact that you're filling yourself with all these carbs and drinking the alcohol, probably mostly the alcohol, which is actually making you sleepy. Not so much the tryptophan, but but nonetheless, it's tryptophan, which is a precursor to serotonin. It's in a lot of things, and even in, from what I understand, in a lot higher quantities in other things besides turkey, such as salmon, cheese, nuts, and seeds. Tofu, I think, as well. Although I don't have that written on there. I'm pretty sure I remember tofu has a lot of tryptophan in it. But um, anyway, so you got that. Then we have the love hormone, which is oxytocin, which essentially helps you to relax, reduce blood pressure, anti-anxiety. As a result of all that, helps to control cortisol levels. Natural ways to release this stuff. So this will be kind of different to everybody. You know, certain smells or fragrances, man, whatever turns you on, I guess. Um, music tied to memories. You know, but what I find, too, actually can be kind of interesting is you can listen to, like, a love song in a totally different language. Right? You don't know what they're saying, but you just catch the vibes and the feels off of that. So that can also can, can kind of be this whole um, oxytocin, um, oxytocin thing working on you, romantic locations, cute things. You know, so if you're like watching cute cat videos on the Internet, getting all these warm fuzzes in your stomach, that's oxytocin working on you. And then, of course, touching, holding hands, hugging, whatever. All those things can also release some um, oxytocin as well. And. After that, see, we blew through that pretty quickly. Now we're on to the techniques and methods parts here. I think this is probably a good place to stop. So um, with that said, until the next video, aloha.